Oh, well, thanks, Suzanne. Hello, we're inside the Green Room Live. Um, I'm your co-host, Blair Bryant Nichols, and today I've got a very special guest with me, Suzanne Evans. She is a New York Times bestselling author that went from secretary to multi-seven-figure CEO in just three years. She is known as the tell-it-like-it-is, no-fluff boss of business building. Her work blends business, strategy, lifestyle, and storytelling in a way that allows people to build businesses that shape the world to be a better place. Along her journey, she has hit the Inc. 500 slash 5,000 for five straight years, been featured in Forbes, won countless business awards, and wrangled the toddler to almost being civilized. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so we're excited to have you today. I know that you've got a connection to AYR. I know that Pete Vargas, our CEO, has spoken at your events before. So I'm excited to bring you inside the green room and, and uncover more of the brilliance that you share all the time with your clients and audiences. So let's let's kind of backtrack, though, a little bit. You know, our audience is made up of, of speakers and, and folks like the, the type of clients that you have that are using speaking to build their business, as well as meeting planners and event organizers. But how did you get started in this industry? How did you start building Driven Inc? And, and what, you know, really inspired you to, to make that shift into entrepreneur? Well, I, I was, I was working in the Broadway theater industry at the time, and I had uh, opened five Broadway shows and um, Chicago and Annie Get Your Gun and Susical and Sweet Charity and on and on. And I actually really enjoyed the, I mean, it was cool. It was fun work. You're putting Reba McIntyre into Annie Get Your Gun and you're having dinner with Usher. You know, it wasn't the worst life in the world. Um, but there was a couple of challenges. And one was um, most people in the entertainment business don't make much money. Um, and so that was a challenge. Um, but I also didn't, really couldn't see where I wanted to go in the Broadway theater industry because you grow into two patterns either general management, which really wasn't my thing, or um, producing, which I wasn't sure I wanted to do, and it's a hard nut to crack. So I started looking at what I wanted to do with the rest of my life and what who I wanted to be when I grew up. And long story short, um, I came across coaching, and um, my my wife said, "Oh, you're you're thinking about coaching? I've been I've been uh, DVRing this TV show. I think that you should watch it. It was a TV show called Starting Over that was Ayanna Van Zant, Rhonda Britton, and some folks." And I watched it and they put women in a house for 30 days to help them make their life over. And I thought, this is my calling to put a bunch of women in a house and boss them around for 30 days. I should do this for a living. Um, and so long story, very, very multiple year story, because I think that's how most entrepreneur stories go to make it short. I actually started off as a life coach, as a side hustle in my day job. So I was working a 60 hour week day job in the Broadway theater industry. I started a little life coaching business. I was making like $50,000 in my job. And in the first year, I was making $100,000 in the life coaching business. And I thought, well, this may work, but I'm not going to quit my day job yet. So I stayed in my day job, still working 60 hours a week. Um, and I, I ended up making $200,000 the second year while still making $50,000 a year in the day job. And we were putting Christina Applegate into Sweet Charity. And she had broken her ankle actually in Minneapolis. She broke her attitude in Detroit. And um, we were trying to get the show open. And in Sweet Charity, there's this amazing number that all the women come to the front of the stage and they sing, there's gotta be something better than this. There's gotta be something bigger to do. And when I find that something better to do, I'm gonna get out and go live it. And I thought, holy shit, they're singing to me. And I better quit my job. I better make this thing for real. And I did. And of course, I was a horrible life coach. I was terrible. I was the worst at it. I was making a quarter of a million dollars a year. People would call me and say, you know, I'm struggling with my husband. And I would say, well, leave him. And they were like, I, I don't want to leave my husband. I'm like, then why do you want to talk about it? Then just put up with him. You chose him. Sure, you're right. Live with it. I was not the best life coach, but I was really good at business. And I built that business really quickly. And um, obviously working in the Broadway theater industry, every time you open a show, you're building a new business. And so when I shifted to, um, to being a business consultant and coach um, and uh, started building out the divisions of my company, we grew very quickly. We did a million dollars in revenue in about 10 months. And um, I did leave that job. And now I'm here today. And uh, that's kind of how it all played out. It's total crazy story, which I always like to share because you really can't start from anywhere, start from nothing, and you can build a business if you use speaking, because I use speaking to grow my business. 
Oh, wonderful. Well, that's that's what I want to dive into. But first, I just want to unpack a little bit the analogy you shared there. You know, the folks who aren't familiar with the entertainment business might not might not realize that every movie, every book, every everything is almost like launching a company. And and you know, most of them don't pan out. Most most movies don't make billions of dollars, and most books the same. So everyone in the entertainment industry is a bit of an entrepreneur. And, and a lot of times, you know, you're really just trying to gather that support to get something big off the ground. And you hope, like in the farm industry, you hope that the one big breakout drug is the one that's going to make, you know, the, the end of year sales. So um, it's interesting for those who, you know, might not have experience in that to think about how that it is a it is a little bit like that in that industry. But that for that reason, it's also really challenging to keep that sort of career going and to, to keep having success and to keep building on it. And there's not a lot of room for everyone to have that level of success. So it makes sense. When I started out in publishing myself, and it's kind of the same, similar story. I was in the speakers bureaus for HarperCollins, for Harper Hachette and Simon and & Schuster. And I felt like everyone around me was gonna go one of two ways, either growing up that path and maybe just being kind of an executive and in the business route or they're actually just a frustrated writer and they're gonna go and finally get their MFA and write that novel. And so, well, I was trying to face that same decision myself and I went the MBA route because I thought, hey, it's really cool to be working with authors, working with celebrities and people, but you know, there's there's only so much you can do with them in, in this limited right. capacity. I wanted to do more on the business side. So how did you start attracting clients for your life coaching business for your business consult consulting? How did you say, hey, I'm I've been in working in Broadway, but I, I know how to teach you about your business. How did you start moving away from that side of your career and and actually securing clients and convincing them to work with you and then building out the rest of your company? I got most of my clients in the beginning at Whole Foods. This is an absolutely true story. Um, I did that, you know, the very traditional uh, route of like, send out your warm letters and your warm emails and make good connections, which I did. And I got some clients. This is still when I was on the life coaching side. I, I, was, it, I was kind of shifting to the other side, but um, I was in Whole Foods one day and I was with my wife and we were shopping and I looked at her and I said, oh my God, I have a great idea. And she said, if I could just ask you one thing. And I said, yeah, Melanie. She said, please don't have an idea in Whole Foods. I know you, I live with you, have it anywhere. Have the idea when we get home. And I said, no, I have it. So I went and got the manager and I was like, hi, this is what I do. And I would like to like speak at your Whole Foods or and he was like, no, we don't do that. And I said, well, then I'd like to set up a booth, a life coaching booth in your Whole Foods. He said, no, we don't do that. And I said, sir, would you step outside with me? To this day, the fact that he walked outside with me, it, it still blows me away. And we looked up and at the time, I don't know if it's still their logo, but it was Whole Foods, Whole Body, Whole Life. And I said, listen, you are crushing it with the food. There is so much food in there. You've got it. Whole body, you've got body products. I actually saw a massage, you know, somebody doing a massage chair. I said, but you're not doing anything with Whole Life and I'm afraid you're going to get sued. And he, I mean, I don't know if he was just exhausted or thought I was totally nuts. So he said, fine, on Sundays, bring a table from like two to four o'clock. And every Sunday, my wife, Melanie, we only had one car at the time, would drop me off at the end of the parking lot because she wouldn't pull me in because I was in our neighbor's shop there and she was embarrassed. And I would take a table into Whole Foods and I would set it up and people would come in and I would say, do you want to talk about life coaching? And they would all say no. Or most of them would say, do you know where the soy sauce is? And so I would take them to the soy sauce and start talking to them. And long story short, I figured it out by talking to hundreds of people. I, my booth was between the organic tomatoes and bananas. And I talked to hundreds of people every single week. And, some, and I started to learn what people wanted, what their pains were, what their problems were. And so this entire copy developed within me, standing in the produce section at Whole Foods. And I started to get clients and I broke through that first six figures from the produce section at Whole Foods. And I tell people all the time, I never, I mean, I worry, I run a business, I have 20 employees, it's crazy, but I never overly worry because people go, what if, what if this all goes away? I go, I saved that sign that I made and took with me to Whole Foods. So I'm really not afraid of anything because if you will stand beside tomatoes and pedal life coaching, you'll fucking do anything. 
right? You'll do anything. And that's what it takes to be successful as an entrepreneur. Most people aren't willing to do anything. Most people aren't willing to make a fool of themselves. Most people aren't willing to show up and talk about what you do and talk to people enough that your copy and your angle and your point of view evolves and develops. That's, that's I don't incredible. Go to anymore. I don't do that at home anymore, but <laughs> I would if I needed to. Yeah, they'll they'll drag you out nowadays. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you, know, you have to keep your distance. You can't talk to people like that anymore, unfortunately. So, <laughs> so what were you offering though? So, were you talking to them every day? I was were offering you one-on-one -on -one coaching at the time. I was offering one-on-one -on -one coaching at the time. Obviously, that evolved, and as my business grew and as I, I left the day job. Um, my, my main primary uh, source of Legion was speaking. And I was speaking to groups of four people. I was speaking to groups of 40. At that time, I wasn't speaking to groups much bigger than maybe 75, 100 people. But um, when I was in the day job, I would book myself to speak all weekend long at anything I could book myself on. And I would book myself after 7.30 for speaking gigs because I lived in the city and it would take me an hour commute just to get out of the, I uh, worked in the city and all of that. Um, and to this day, you know, about 80% of my revenue, uh, this day is probably 70, 70% 70 of my revenue stream still comes from speaking. Um, I have two speaking gigs today. I have three speaking gigs tomorrow. Um, next week I have four. Uh, I think the week after that I have like nine in one week. And I really go from the philosophy that um, Tony Robbins' business was built off of something he heard um, uh, Jim Rohn say. Jim Rohn was at a conference and he said, I built this entire business off of uh, three speaking gigs a week. I built this empire off of three speaking gigs a week. And Tony Robbins said, what could I build if I did three speaking gigs a day? And that's how I built the business. It's how I still build the business. And um, a lot of my colleagues spend millions of dollars a year on Facebook advertising. Um, I spend very, very little. Um, I still use small gigs and big gigs as my uh, primary source of revenue to have a multiple seven figure uh, coaching business. Um, and it's, uh, it's gotten a lot easier since it's all virtual. <laughs> yeah, well, another <laughs> area that I'd love to explore, but how did you get started with those speaking gigs? Are you reaching out to people that you knew? How did, how did that start to come in? And then when, when did you start making the shift to start scaling this, to make it where you're sure. starting your own events, where I know you've got an event coming up in November sure. um, and you've done a lot of these. So talk to us about a little bit more of that next step. Yeah, so, so a couple of things. First of all, I, I hate that I'm not in my office because we are working from home and out of the office because I have, I have my calendar from those first two years in business and I show it sometimes when I'm on a webinar because I kept something called a speaking list 100 and I still teach my clients to do this today. And that is that most people spend time trying to get gigs and then they are frustrated or they fail or they just get a couple because the, the average return rate on booking a speaking gig is one to two speaking gigs for every 50 outreaches. You do the math on that and you start going, oh my God, right? It's, a, it's kind of daunting, but it's not daunting when you do, when you reverse engineer it. So from the very beginning, I spent more time researching gigs than I did reach outs. Because if I always had an incredible list of, um, the ability of places to reach out to, I always had work to do. I always had somebody to call, somebody to ask. So in the beginning, I would spend two to three hours a week on the research of speaking gigs. And I used a very sophisticated software that um, I think is uh, pretty incredible and everyone should use it and it's called Google. And um, I, I lit here's the cool thing. It's like one of those, if you were a smarty pants math person, which I'm not, um, I, I, this could go to infinity, I think, but I would put in G, I would put in my target market. I would put in geographic location and I would put in a word, workshop, conference, event, association, group, organization. And if you start changing the geographics and you shift the word that is your target market a little bit, and then you keep using those different words, you get results to infinity. It will never end. Remember, there's 7,000 meetings a day that happen in North America that are looking for a speaker. 7,000 meetings a day. So I kept my 
100 list and I never had less than 100 on it. So I always had 20 reach outs to do that day or 50 reach outs to do that day. So I still do that to this day. Our list is more like 500 at any given time. Um, and so that that's literally how I got started. And I think that people don't put enough time into the research piece and they put all their effort into the reach out and then they don't have enough people to reach out to and then they're frustrated and they don't get the results they wanna get. And I don't remember what the hell your question was. So tell me if I messed that up. No, you're you're right on track. I was just talking about how building your speaking business. So I think scale. that's yeah. interesting to you know put a lot of emphasis on the research because I think people neglect to to know about finding their target audience as much as just finding any event to speak to. I came from the paid speaking world. I worked in bureaus. I you know worked only on paid keynotes for a dozen years. And I didn't think a lot about kind of the sales opportunities that stages and speaking opportunities have for a lot of these speakers, because most of them were happy as long as it is they could pay their fee, you know, but Pete and you and the people in this industry that have really built huge, significant businesses with stages have really opened up my, my mind and my eyes to all of these other opportunities. If you're really dialed in on speaking to the right audience and not as focused on getting the top dollar speaking fee. So how did you figure out, you know, what's your target audience? And you, you mentioned those keywords. How did you refine that? And, and wh where did you find that sweet spot of, of audiences that you started to realize were going to be the ones that convert? Because that's not what you're, you're teaching people is well, how they can actually convert. There's a ripple effect that happens in booking speaking gigs. And I would say anybody on here that's listening to this that's a beginner, like you want to start local, right? It's easy to get to, it's easy to reach the person in charge, it's usually smaller scale. Um, but what happens is not, I'll just, I'll actually give you a very specific example. When I was life coaching and not business coaching, um, actually, you know, business coaching target market is much easier to home. I work with women and men, but for the most part, it's women, um, business owners, under 10 employees, service-based. Right. That's it's it's kind of easy. When I was a life coach, it was actually a little harder because it's that airy, fairy, not tangible space. But I did know that I tend to have uh, was really attracting and converting uh, women over 40 in some form of corporate, but dissatisfied. Right. Um, with kind of their life and their job. And so I focused on that. And so because I had been an executive assistant. Um, when I first started out in the Broadway theater industry, I found an organization called um, the National Association of um, Administrative Assistants. And they all have small, either local chapters, but if there's a big company like, uh, you know, uh, Cisco or something, they may have an organization within their company that has 50 members, you know, 50, 100 members of administrative professionals. So I started booking myself to these little administrative professional places that would have, sometimes there would only be eight people at the meeting, but sometimes they're like Christmas meeting would have 75 people. And so I started booking this, but what happens is they have a regional division and their regional division has a national division. And then you just get on the circuit of this one thing and you can just roll with it. And that happens with thousands of organizations and associations all over the country. So that's really how you're able to scale because you go from the local to the regional to the national. And of course the numbers go up and the exposure goes up and the opportunity goes up. Um, so we still do that to this day too. We will take something local and small and simple because we know it has the potential to lead to a national. I, I also have never really keynoted. Um, I learned very early on, this was kind of my Broadway theater background and, and, and understanding ticket sales and scale. I knew that I would, no one would ever be able to afford to pay me for a keynote. And what I mean when I say that is, you know, my average when I'm selling from the stage and sometimes I'm speaking and, and making free offers, but when I'm selling from the stage, my average takeaway will be about 160,000. That's on average. Well, I'm not Bill Clinton or right, or, you know, Venus Williams, I'm not gonna get paid $160,000 to speak as a keynoter. So I would much rather speak everywhere free and make offers because what I get on the back end is so much bigger. Right, and, and that's what I think a lot of speakers are missing. A lot of the speakers that, you know, establish some sort of platform for themselves or all of a sudden they start getting some sort of demand for them to speak. They just see the dollar sign attached to the keynote fee and they don't realize the much bigger potential for sales. 
through that stage. So how did you start crafting your offers? How did you start figuring out like what is going to align with this audience? And I also want to, you know, hear how you started negotiating with those folks so that they felt comfortable with you making an offer before this became maybe, you know, a, as much of a standard practice as it is. And a lot of these events that they know are kind of driven by speakers wanting to, you know, address this audience. How did you start making your way into that world and, and made people feel comfortable with that kind of negotiation of not paying a fee, but allowing you to do that? Um, in the beginning, certainty and guilt. And what I mean by that is I just acted as if they would assume that you pay a speaker. So I would say, and here's the good news. You don't need to give me an honorarium. You don't need to pay me. I would just at the end like to share one of my products, programs or services um, for free. And you kind of shock them. And they're like, absolutely, of course we would want you to do that, right? Because I'm just going, listen, don't even pay me. In their mind, they're like, we ain't got nothing to pay you. And I'm like, yeah, so that's a problem. So let me make an offer. So certainty um, is, you know, the person with the most certainty always closes the sale. Um, now, sometimes you have people say, hey, we do not make offers. Say, that's no problem. I have two free gifts that I could offer. Which one of these would feel appropriate and would really work? I've just never really had anybody say no, right? I mean, when you're giving of your time, um, now we know bigger stages, bigger opportunities. Those are negotiated deals. Those are um, things where you're doing splits with the producer, or in many cases, I, I like to pay for stages. I don't do a lot of revenue splits um, because I don't want to deal with people's bullshit and I don't want to deal with other people's problems. I want to pay you something. I want to pay for the opportunity to take your stage, get on stage, sell my stuff, keep it and go home. Right. But that's not always how it is. I do some revenue splits. I do some other things. So there's so many ways to work in a speaking gig. There's there is, you know, m one of my partners in my event that's coming up in November, um, my buddy, Larry Wing, it, he's a keynoter. He's one of the highest paid keynoters in the country. That's not a, you know, a celebrity or someone. And he keynotes, that's what he's done his whole career. And he gets, he go, he shows up, he gets checked, he speaks and he goes home and he goes, you know what I love? I didn't sell them anything. I never have to talk to those people again, right? Um, but for me, right, I'm going and selling a product and there's fulfillment, but there's keynoting, there's going and making a free offer. There's going and making a very small offer, there's going and making a book offer. There's going and sometimes I sell a five thousand dollar product from a you know seventy five minute talk. So there's so much you can do and there's so many different ways that you can go. You need to figure out who you are, who your target market is, and then have a great free offer, have a great smaller priced offer, have a great higher end priced offer, and then plug yourself into the events and conferences and all the things that are happening that work best for you. I love that. I mean, and that's, uh, you know, a lot of what we talk about in our scale workshop and us thinking about, you know, how people can take the stage and, and address those different price points and address different audiences. But I am really interested in, in people's free offers because I, it seems today like a lot of times they, they drift towards the ebook, you know, the kind of the pamphlet or takeaway type thing. But but a lot of folks are getting more interesting and a little bit more unique with their offers. What, what did you start off with offering and, and where have you found how that's evolved and, and what do you think works really well as far as a free offer? Well, you have to remember that a free offer is harder to sell than a paid offer because when in, in essence, saying it is a free offer means there's no value. So you must establish value. So I get a lot of people who come to me, uh, you know, and they're being coached and they're like, I don't get it. I'm going to these places. There were 40 people there and only two people took me up on my free offer. And I go, well, tell me what you said. And you're like, you know, if, if this resonated with you, um, I'd love to offer you a free session. Please sign up in the background. I'm like, nobody woke up in the middle of the night last night and said, you know what? I need a free session, <laughs> right? You, it has to relate to the pain point. So you have to have four factors in a great free offer. The first is, is that it can't be free. You have to give it, you have to assign it a value and you have to sell that value. The second is, is that it has to solve a problem. So you never want to say, I'm going to offer you a free session. It's normally $200. No, it has to be named. Well, it has to be a drop five pounds in five days session, right? So it has to solve a problem. The third thing that it has to do is it has to have some form of urgency, right? Like 
And that's usually in the naming and then the, the definition of it. Like it's going to solve a problem. We're going to get this done in a half an hour. Once you get off this call with me that. And then the last is there has to be some form of a limiter, just like if you were making a paid offer. So you're going to say, listen, my time is limited. I wish I could give 50 of you one of these, but I can't. I have about seven or nine spots on my calendar. So it's going to be first come, first serve, the first nine of you to grab this link or to meet me in the back of the room. It's going to be that. So it is more important to craft a free offer than it is a paid offer because of establishing value. Love that. Yeah. And, and getting people really excited about getting something like that for free rather than just, yeah. oh, this is just another thing that they're handing out at this that this event or just another piece of swag almost that they're never going to look at again because they don't, like you said, assign much value to it because it's just another free thing that they kind of accumulated and they'll look at it when they get the chance. So, you know, you talked a lot about the different stages, how you approach that, how you started to build and scale your speaking business and how you worked with these audiences uh, at different levels to continue to grow your business. But how did you then make that pivot to planning your own events and bringing people in and deciding, hey, I know I can do this, I can deliver on stage, but I want people to come to me and they're going to come and pay for the expertise that I'm sharing. How, when did you start doing that and what, what made you decide to move in that direction? Well, I had an unfair advantage. I mean, I, I did. I came from the Broadway theater industry and I watched how poorly events were being done in the business coaching industry. I mean, it was just pathetic and sad and it was like, great. So you know how to coach people and you know, if you put people in a room, you can inspire them. And the fact that you're torturing people watching this for three days is sad. Um, so I did an event my second year in, it might've been on the tip of my third year in business. And from the very beginning, we have done, we don't do events, we do shows, we do productions. I've had the Broadway cast of Chicago open our events before. Um, we've had Cirque du Soleil open our events before. And I don't just do an opening. I, the entire event is edutainment, right? It is entertaining people through and educating them because no one really wants to go to a three-day event virtual or in person and learn they don't i mean they they want to make money they want to grow their business they're hoping that this event will do some of that um so i i know that if you 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 get people you hold people hostage through inspiration and entertainment and um in inventiveness that they learn as a side effect of that so i don't like i said i had a little bit of an unfair advantage and this is you know i'm not truly a business coach i'm really good i've made you know hundreds of millions of dollars i've made multiple hundreds of millions of dollars for my clients and um, myself but i'm an artist i'm an artist who found a way a clever way to do my art every day and my art is creating productions, creating an experience that you can't turn away from, creating something that um, you will not go pee because you're afraid that you will miss the next five minutes. And that is not through speaking, really. It is through a sensory experience, right, of multiple levels. And so for me, um, I, I really lucked out that this kind of like, theater geek, uh, you know, uh, performed for a while, then was on the production side, was able to put all of that together and every day make a living off of what I do, which is truly creating art. So every time I do a webinar, it's like, what's the theme and how do we, how do we get people to pay attention in a way they've never paid attention before? So I can talk about this for four days, so I'll shut up. <laughs> well, that, that's totally fine. This is where I'd love to dive in now because here we are. We've made it to the fall, hat on the back to us in 2020, we've made it this long, but we all started at the same place in 2020. You know, we launched our agency in January and by March, we were telling everyone that they're gonna be on digital stages only. You had a similar process, I assume, going through with your team and your events. So your, as you just said, your, your art isn't creating these experiences. You know that you can't do a Broadway production on Zoom, but, there's a lot that we've been able to do through technology. So how did you approach making this pivot now from live events to virtual events and bringing in that same sensory experience that you'd mastered over the years to something virtual? You know, it's funny. I think, well, I think everybody that's in the event space freaked out about everything for a little bit, right? I mean, it was all just like, oh my God, we all got to pivot. We all got to do something. But I think a lot of people were really focused on the technology, right? Because we all had to kind of think through a technology that would support 
uh, an experience that felt like you were in a room. So I kind of let the industry focus on the technology side because I was like, everybody's going to run a few events. They're going to sort out what works and what doesn't work. And I kind of know what will work, but I'm sure I'll watch some people hiccup or watch some people really succeed. We'll take that. In. I really focused on the psychology of a virtual event and what that psychology meant. Um, and, and for me, I know I also was anticipating and predicting Zoom fatigue, right? And that we would all get done with this experience that we were having 10, 11 hours a day. And so I really put my focus onto a multi-sensory virtual event. So how do we incorporate music, right, into an event, live music, and, and make people feel uh, the experience of that. And how do we incorporate, um, you know, a lot of people, it, it was an obvious for people to do direct mail and do boxes, but I was seeing a lot of boxes being sent out that were gifts. And I was like, how do we send out a box that is full of sensory experiences? The box had food in it and the box had uh, things that opened and exploded and the thing box had moments where you touch this and this happened. And so I really put my focus on that because I knew the technology would all sort itself out. And I also knew that everybody would do, be doing a little bit of the same because it just, you, you have to, it's like certain platforms work better than others. And I wanted for people to be in their homes for three days, um, but feel like they took an adventure, feel like they went on an experience, feel like um, they went somewhere and doing that through a multi-sensory experience, which is which is what really I focused on, which is it's kind of my wheelhouse and it's what I love to do anyway. So for us, um, it was nerve wracking in the beginning because everybody's businesses were pivoting, but then it actually became exhilarating and I had so much fun doing it. I can't wait for our next one. So, so tell us about the next one. What, what have you got planned and, and what what worked for you pivoting to virtual and, and where did things not work out quite as well as you had hoped, you know, uh, with the limitations um, that virtual, that you virtual know, still has? It, it, most of it worked out better than I thought, you know, you're holding your breath on a few areas, right? But most of it worked out better than I thought. Um, we, uh, we certainly had some hiccups in backlog. I mean, you know, we had about a thousand people at the last event, and we certainly had some backlogs in some certain areas of um, in our coaching zone and things like that. So we learned some things about how to sort and separate so we didn't have virtual lines and, and things like that. So I think that was one of the biggest things. And I don't know that even if, you know, my friends and colleagues who'd run their events said, oh, do this, don't do this, but you also just have to do one, right? Like you have to do it to work out the kinks for your people and your team and um, and your event. So um, what I think was worked, it was really extraordinary was the ability to uh, reach more people, right? I mean, the ability to, for people who really do have a, a, a child challenge or a health challenge or a travel challenge or that we're finally, you know, we have people who are like, I wanted to come to your events for eight years, you know, and I finally came to one. And so um, that, that was a good reminder uh, to me that um, the world is bigger than you have made it, Suzanne, right? The world is bigger than your events and how you're doing them and what that looks like. And COVID kind of came in as a push to do things for all of us in a different way. So um, yeah, so I'm really excited about our event in November. Um, that event is called Take the Stage. And um, my good friend, Larry Winget, I bring him in to co-teach that. I kind of teach the selling from the stage side. He teaches the keynote side. Um, he has, you know, he, he likes to, he has six New York Times bestsellers. I only have one. Um, so we kind of co-teach on the book side of it and the point of view side on it and the media platform. So it's really um, a personality brand event that's core focus is speaking. Um, and we're going to do some really, uh, some really fun, cool things we're working on as well, because this has always been a really experiential event. So working to continue to make it very experiential while not having to leave your home. Um, I also travel a lot, you know, Pete, uh, the head of your company travels a lot. And I have to say, I haven't missed a single Marriott salad over the last... <laughs> right over the last uh few months um so it's a it's it we're really looking forward to it and we're looking forward to it because um this isn't going to change for a while 
right? The virtual piece of this. And so I'm really excited to teach what we have done to pivot to a virtual um, experience. And if, and if, it, and when it does change, it's not going to change overnight. It's going to change more to hybrid, right? And then hybrid is maybe going to evolve back into in-person. But the interesting thing is we're going to come back in person because people want that, but we're also not going to lose the virtual side because people are used to the convenience of it now. So we're establishing a new norm. So I'm excited about teaching about that as well, which is something I haven't taught about in a three-day event because the world wasn't what it is now. Yeah. I love that. I love how you started out talking about accessibility because that's something we yeah. talked about a little bit on this podcast and and how it's opened up the opportunity for so many people and, and around the world, not just if yeah. they have a disability or if there's a cost factor, travel factor, but also just so many new audiences are getting the opportunity to experience these events from, from where they live. And I've seen so many events that now have moved to a pre-recorded model. I still love the live model, but I appreciate that at least they're thinking about how to distribute content in a way that's accessible to other sure. time zones, et cetera. Um, the other thing you mentioned, which of course is just such a benefit for speakers is you don't have to be a road warrior anymore. <laughs> Not it's gone forever and you're never gonna see another Marriott salad, but I think a lot of speakers you know, who initially were very concerned that their whole business was wiped out, their entire calendar of keynotes was gone overnight. As they started to see virtual pick up, they started to see what a benefit it could be. As you mentioned at the beginning of this interview, you've got you've got a dozen over the next couple of weeks alone, you know, and I assume those are all virtual. Um, so there's a real, you know, benefit to speakers that- and, for the, and, and I'll speak to the parents out there. I mean, for me, my business was just on a crazy rocket ship um, and I had a child and I didn't want to be gone all the time. And so I really adapted my business to get off the road. And so my business, I dropped some divisions of my business and it shifted and some things changed. And this has actually put me in a position, right? To be able to do a lot of the things I was doing pre-Adrian um, because everything is virtual. So for parents, there's such a great opportunity to like get back in the game and to do more and to say yes to more. I had to say no to 70% of everything that used to come my way. And now I'm able to say yes to 70% of it because I'm not leaving my kid to go do it. That's awesome. And I think we're all going to be thinking about pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID. So I, I want to ask this, and, and I maybe want to circle back to what you said about how you're shifting some of the curriculum at your event to accommodate this new hybrid virtual world. But but what are the things that you've now been able to do, like you just mentioned, because of COVID that you don't want to lose in a, in a world where we're able to travel, that you that you really want to continue to carry into your business and, and your speaking and, and what you're doing that's been kind of opened up as an opportunity because of this event? This may be a little more personal and self-reflective, but hopefully it's it may be useful to people. Um, for me, it was uh, urgency. So I had a really nice life and a really nice business, and I had stabilized that business to support my son and all of that. And of course, COVID came and I'm like, crisis mode. And I, I do my best work in burning buildings, right? That is not healthy for a team <laughs> right? because we're always waiting for a burning, a burning building for me to get like my creativity or whatever. But it, it did, you know, that burning building moment of like, we had a pivot. We got to make sure this company stays afloat. I got 20 mouths to feed. I got right. It just created such an urgency and such a drive and such a, a hunger to serve my clients that I'm like, why does it take this to do that? Right. How do I, how do I generate that? on a normal Wednesday, right? How do I generate that just on any given Tuesday? And so that was a real self-reflection for me of how I, who I am in my business and how I operate within my business. And then the other thing I would say was shame on me, right? Like I love live events because I come from that theater background and that, that world and like shame on me that I wasn't doing more digital and I wasn't doing more virtual. And I was going, sorry, Australia. So you don't want to fly to my event, you know, too bad, you know, and now we'll have 50, hundred people from Australia. And so it also made me pause and go, um, you can be just as creative in this context, get your head out of your ass and do that. And once I made that shift, I've loved it and I don't want to lose that. I love that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, people taking a look at what's really important and what's really, uh, you know, impactful to a business and, and, and looking at health 
you know, something we're doing at AYR is looking at creating balance in a healthy environment so that it isn't, you know, seasons of panic and, and nonstop work, and then like some recovery time, like how do we create consistently balance, you know, for, for everyone in the organization. Yeah. Um, so I know we're coming to the close uh, of our of our time here. Um, I did, like I said, want to circle back. You know, what are some of the things that you think are important for people to know that you said you're excited to teach kind of this new virtual <clears throat> dynamic, the hybrid model, and and coming from a Broadway background, just showing up virtually is so different than being on stage and being in the room. What are some of the things that you you know you're talking to clients about that you're excited to share uh, with folks at your event in November? I would say a ton, but let's focus kind of on three. One is you cannot take a talk or a stage experience and go, now I'm going to put it on Zoom, right? There, it doesn't translate. And everybody in the beginning was saying it did. Seriously, everybody was like, just take what you're doing and put it on Zoom. And I'm like, and no one will give a shit, right? Because it is a different platform. It's a different medium. Um, of course, there's a lot of elements that you can translate. So understanding um like i'll just say two quick things understanding that what i'm doing with you today blair in this format takes five times more energy than if i were we were sitting on a stage in a room across a table from each other so understanding like energy levels and how to translate that understanding engagement and how you create engagement and what that looks like understanding um how you get people to not multitask i mean there's just a million things so sharing a lot of that i'm really excited about i'm also excited to share about kind of the book side of all of this um and what this means for publishing and what it means for writing a book um, i have a, a book coming out at the event um that that came out of virtual speaking i did so much virtual speaking that we took it all and are turning it into a book. So, so that ability that virtual gives you for repurposing um, and recycling content. So lot, lots of really cool stuff like that, that we, we would have touched on uh, a year ago, but we wouldn't have delved into. Right. So much, so much great learning. And it sounds like, you know, have a really awesome opportunity to take eight months of, of just this crazy pressure cooker situation and really unpack that for your audience. I think that's going to be super valuable. So I want to close out with what we like to, to share, you know, chat with people about speakers that influence them. So as you're getting started, or even just in the last year or so, has there been a speaker that really impacted you, made you excited to get into this industry or helped change the way that you approach things? I know you and Larry have a really great relationship, but is there anyone else that that also kind of led you down this path? Yeah, I will say no one delivers a speech better than Larry Wingo. I mean, it's how we, we became friends because I saw him speak uh, and I reached out to him and said, I'd love for you to coach me. He said, I don't coach people, go away. This was our real interaction. And I wrote him back over and over again until he, I wore him down and he said, fine, just come to my house. You're weirdo. Like, let's just get this over with. Um, because no one, his craftsmanship of a speech is so extraordinary. Um, I would say, um, uh, I, I'm a political junkie. So, um, uh, I would say that there's so many politicians and some of them are like on the local level that I love to watch, like get a message across. So I, I watch, I follow all politics, all sides, because I, I love it from that standpoint. Um, but I will say the person who probably has the most consistent impact on me from a speaking standpoint that that isn't Larry now that we're best friends and he doesn't count anymore um, is TD, TD Jakes. Um, without a doubt, I think to have to live your life um, generating a brand new speech every single week um, off of the same book, right? The same book every single week and generating something that moves the masses and the way he is able to do that is nothing short of genius. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so you guys should definitely check him out and, and pick up on, on how he's exercising his art and creativity each week through that. And Suzanne, how can our listeners get in touch with you, learn more about Take the Stage and just more information about you and Driven Inc.? Absolutely. I think we did a link so you guys pay less for a ticket, which is cool. So that's drivenwithpete.com, um, Driven with Pete. And um, I think if you look on our website, like the prices are 147 and that's 97. So giving you guys a little discount there. So you can join us at the event by, um, by going there. I'm Driven Inc. 
INC, not INK, we don't do any tattoos. So it's driveninc.com and you can always uh, reach out to us there. You can find information. And I always just say, shoot me an email. I'm like the world's fastest emailer. So I'm Suzanne, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E -N -N -E, at driveninc.com. If you have a question, if you have a complaint, if you have a concern, if you have a need, happy to help you in any way I can. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for joining us inside the green room. I'm Blair Nichols, and we have been live inside our Facebook group, Your Events Matter. If you haven't joined us there yet, please do so you can join us next time for our live conversation. You can listen to this episode and catch up on episodes you've missed anywhere you listen to podcasts. That's Inside the Green Room with PV3. And check out our free resources at our website, InsideTheGreenRoomPodcast.com. Thanks again. Thank you.